So this video was supposed to be out a while ago, but the file got corrupted and I lost everything. So let's see if take two is a little bit better. This episode begins with Imogen in a dream, the dream of the Crimson Storm that she has seen so many times. But this time, there's something very different. Usually Imogen's mother is just telling her to run, but now there's a second option. Imogen feels the gem that is now with her in the dream and feels it trying to comfort her. This gem is an escape. And I think here Matt is offering Laura Bailey a choice. Do you go down the plan story, which is you keep running, or do you allow that corruption to seep into Imogen? Laura chooses to keep running, but now we also see why potentially other NPCs like Duggar or Lady Emoth Cade accepted the gem and its comforting presence. And then later on, Fresh Cut Grass is able to use Identify on this stone and learn that it is part of the Gnarl Rock. The Gnarl Rock is a well-known rock in the Feywild, and what it does is it mutates everything around it, giving it a new twisted and corrupted form. And let me just combine this information with another piece of information that we learned inside this episode, and that's a bit about Fern's past. See, Fern came to the Material Plane because she wanted to go exploring, but before she left for the Material Plane, her parents disappeared. Now, the parents were sending letters to Fern, and the last letter is from Aeor. And just look at Matt's face as Ashley reveals this information. Either this is 100% bullshit, or Ashley just dropped some huge piece of plot that will affect the entire campaign. I think that the Gnarled Rock is connected to Aeor, or not necessarily Aeor, but the Calamity. That corrupting influence that we've been touching on in this series, discussing it in terms of Aeor, seems to be coming back around. We've talked about how there is something corrupting the Feywild, or there is a corrupting presence spreading through the Feywild, and the Gnarl Rock seems to be connected to that. I don't think it is like the end-all be-all corrupting presence, but I think that is definitely a part of it. And the language that has been being used, like the nightmarish transformation of nature, resembles the language that has been talked about with Ira the Nightmare King. And then it would make sense that Ira knows about the Callaways since they're from the Feywild and potentially have connections to Aeor. Everything is just fitting together so well. But moving on, the party goes and meets with Gianna Hexum once again. And after some, let's say, negotiations, they agree to take the quest in the Heartmore to play in Gianna's weird heist game. The party splits, saying goodbye to uh, Lord Esteros while the other party goes off and meets with Milos, telling him that they're going to be leaving and getting fresh cut grass basically a checkup. And nothing is wrong mechanically with him, just some old parts. It's mainly this mental block that caused the issues from last session. But after that, they leave Drusar and head for the Heartmore Hamlet. And this is the first time we've left Drusar this campaign. And I'll be honest, I'm kind of torn because I love Drusar. And it's kind of started to feel like home in this campaign. But also, I'm ready to see what else Matt has out there. And man, this travel allows us to see all the work Marisha and team did with the set as I found myself completely immersed with the the rain, all the plants that they had put in for the seventh year anniversary, the just wonderful sounds of the jungle in the background. It was great and it improved the role playing as Laura Bailey was on her A game this episode, but the one of the moments I love the most is Imogen just walking out into the jungle and enjoying the silence. I think the set added so much to that moment, along with Laura Bailey's incredible acting. And during the travel, we get a few interesting, I wouldn't say lore drops, but hints towards what might be going on, as there were two specific instances of fuckery. Firstly, there is a timber rabbit chase that was done by Orm, and he plucked this pink-colored gemstone out of this huge rabbit's mouth, and this was a Feywild shard. That's clue one, and clue two was kind of detecting uh, the energy of the forest, and everything within this jungle, not really a forest, a jungle, uh, had a bit of a Feywild tinge. It's almost like one of two options. Someone is spreading this Feywild influence throughout the area, or maybe the planes are like overlapping. I think the former is more likely though, that someone, something, or an organization is trying to 
adapt the material plane to be more like the Feywild. But now we have to start getting into not only my favorite moments of the episode, but some of my favorite moments in all of Campaign 3. Let's start with Ashton and Fern talking. And this scene is a continuation of their little pickpocket competition that they have going on between each other, which is just so charming and something that I really enjoy seeing between the two characters. But then Ashton reveals that he wasn't always an Earth Genasi, that he began to shift and change around 10 or 11. And I definitely think that this is going to be a huge plot point moving further and an integral part to Ashton's backstory. And I'm interested to see where that maybe goes. Usually if you're not born a Ganassi, you experience some sort of primordial energy that would change you. So what would Ashton have been around that caused him to change like that? I don't know, but I think it will be a great moment in the future. And now we have to discuss probably the highlight of this entire episode, and it's so fortuitous that it happened on the seven-year anniversary of Critical Role, Orm and Laudna talk. And Orm asks Laudna how much she remembers about her final moments, about her death. And as Laudna is talking, the dice gods smile down, because the dice gods sometimes just decide that a moment will be great. And this was one of those moments where Liam rolls a history check, rolls a 23, and realizes that Laudna was the Vexalia lookalike that was hanging from the sun tree in Campaign 1 of Critical Role with Vox Machina, killed by the Briarwoods to send a message to the party. And man, just what a moment to do it, and the scene afterward is just incredible. Both Liam and Marisha really showed why they are professional actors. When Liam unleashed the line that Lana was the happiest person in the group despite everything that happened to her, I was like, man, this is going to be a line that sticks with me forever. And then Marisha flips it around. She delivered probably one of her best lines ever. And it was a line that broke me as she says that the worst thing that has ever happened to her has already happened. So yeah, she's happy. I mean, good God. Guys, look at the faces of all the cast members in this moment. It is such a devastatingly powerful line. And it kind of, I won't lie, broke me for a moment listening to it. That line by Marisha will go down in critical role history. Mark my words. And we can't forget how great Liam was before and after this line because he pulled out some incredible role-playing. And you know what? Liam has been on a roll lately where at the start of the campaign he had more of a step back, but now he is inserting himself more in these incredible role-playing moments. And it must be difficult because Orm is played as like an everyman, just a regular guy. But Liam is balancing that aspect of his character while also going deep into these really complex emotional role-playing moments. And that cannot be easy. So hats off to Liam, and I'm glad that his character and he as a player was the one to help Laudna reveal this portion of her backstory. And already after that line, it was a great scene, but... Liam and Marisha just kept on heightening the scene, and for me it crescendoed in two moments. Firstly, uh, Laudna's bone-chilling story about how they carved up her ears to make them look like elven ears, and just the tragedy of that. And then kind of the ending moment where Orem apologized to Laudna and gives her a hug. And then Liam makes the character choice to stay up all night that night, just thinking about what had happened to Laudna. Perfect ending to that scene. And now, more than ever, I love Laudna's character. I love Laudna's character beforehand, but just going through that backstory and having these great emotional connections there with other characters in the present is just perfect. And now let's just think about if Delilah Briarwood ever, I don't know, comes back in any way, shape, or form and begins to torment Laudna. I mean, Laudna died by Delilah's hand, was beaten and tortured before being killed, even worse. So for her to come back around, it's going to be hard, but I think it can also make for an amazing story. Moving on though, Imogen and Fresh Cut Grass also had a really cool moment together where they cast a tech thoughts uh, on each other at the same time and kind of had this mind meld. And firstly, that's just so cool. And it's so great because not only were the players willing to try something like that, but Matt the DM was willing to allow it and say yes and and build on the moment. And I think that part alone, the creativity was beautifully handled. 
But then the second great part that came out of this was that we got to see Freshcut Grass's backstory a little bit more. We got to see the interactions with him and the other automatons and Dancer and the joy that he felt, the genuine emotions, and then the sorrow at seeing them all destroyed. And I think we're building on a very specific theme now for Fresh Cut Grass, because he is very adamant that he's not alive, that he doesn't have a soul, that he's not living or a person, but everything is pointing to the exact opposite. Fresh Cut Grass is a person. Soul or no soul, it doesn't matter, but the emotions that he feels, how he processes them, the happiness, the sorrow, the sadness, the longing for a past that will never be again. All of this speaks to, to sentience, to a subjectivity that is undeniable within Fresh Cut Grass. And for a character named Fresh Cut Grass, it is fucking insane to me that we are dealing with the question of what makes you a person in a character like this, Sam Regal, I tip my hat to you once again. Somehow, someway, you made a character called Fresh Cut Grass have one of the most philosophically complex backstories ever in the history of Critical Role. You absolute madman. And finally, we have to touch on the moment between Orm and Chetney. And firstly, their relationship together is so nice. They are both so pure when you combine them. It's just two dudes being dudes, and it's a really awesome friendship for the two to have. And in this moment where they're both just kind of, you know, hanging out, Orum's moon tattoo is brought up, and he reveals that the tattoo is in honor of his late husband, Will. Will has been dead for six years and died during the attack on the Arashari. And I have not watched Exandria Unlimited, so I don't know all the backstory there, but hearing uh, about Orum's husband and why he's engaging on the mission he's engaging on just makes everything so much richer about Orem's character. And I'm also very interested in all the linking to the moon that this party has. Well, firstly, Chetney and Orem are linked together with the moon, as Chetney is a werewolf, Orem has the moon tattoo, but then, you know, the party themselves are just linked to the general moon as well, based on all the astrological phenomena. So I guess it's going to be interesting to see how that all shapes out, and if the moon will continue to play a bigger role in this campaign. It's already playing a pretty big one, but I think that we're going to get even more into Ruidus and Katha as well. No spoilers about the most recent book, but based on that, I think Matt is really considering the implications of both of his moons about now. But before we can get into all that and start the heist in the heart more, the party ends the session about to fight this weird anglerfish plant monster. So we'll see how that fight shapes up, but if you're needing some more content before the next episode of Critical Role, you can check this video right here. And thank you for entering the dungeon.